This brings me to introduce the next speaker who has been a former president of Guyana, someone who has always advocated for the sugar industry, and the leader, current leader of the opposition. Ladies and gentlemen, I invite Honorable Barat Jagdew to the podium. Honorable Minister of State Joseph Harmon, distinguished colleagues at the head table, especially our brothers from Canada, um, distinguished members of the diplomatic corps, colleagues of the parliament, special invitees, ladies and gentlemen. We are engaged today in an ungodly act right here. And I say this because on January 27, 2018, one of our vice presidents said, God wanted sugar to fail. And so we are here today to say that sugar is too big to fail, but he believes that God wanted sugar to fail. This is the position from our Vice President, Kemrad Ramjitan, speaking to the media. But I'm sure that he doesn't speak for God. And after listening to his colleague, um, to Minister Harmon, I know there is a concept debated globally now whether you could have alternative facts. <laughs> so, <laughs> because facts are facts. But he is a good advocate for that concept. And so I want to uh, start by t telling you, sharing our perspective on how issues relating to the sugar industry have progressed in the last three years from a different perspective and how those same events are viewed that were so eloquently described by the minister are viewed with different eyes from a different set of people. So I think, um, first of all, as I said before, it's a fallacy that the decision to, to send home 7,000 sugar workers and to close several estates has been grounded in some theoretical work, namely the commission of inquiry or any other study. That's, that's a fallacy. And I intend to prove that. And secondly, that there has been a process of consultation as they approach these crucial decisions, the crucial decisions which have led to 7,000 people now without a job, maybe 40 to 50,000 of their members of their family on the breadline without any support from the government of Guyana. In fact, as was pointed out here, the things that they are eligible to for, by law, their severance pay, has to be negotiated with this government. And we had one minister of the government, the Minister of Agriculture said, we can't pay all the severance now because the sugar workers will just spend out the money. This is their severance which is due to them by law. They have worked hard for this. And this is his attitude, a condescending attitude. We can't give them their severance. So I want to, I want to go through 
a few of these issues. And I, I plan not to speak very long. I'm not a morning speaker, but a minister. So we can start off with the commission of inquiry itself. Because the minister spoke about it. The COI, in, in fact, before that, he said that when we got into office, we found the co a cooperation with $82 billion of debt. And therefore, that was the basis for reform and change. It was unsustainable. We could not move forward with that level of indebtedness. Reform was necessary. So is the PPP opposed to reform and change? The answer is no. But we believe that reform and change must be, especially when you're dealing with what everyone acknowledges to be the largest industry in terms of employment of people, reform and change have to be grounded on the basis of studies and theoretical work and an ass a, a realistic assessment of the situation. So, is the $82 billion figure a real figure? If you look at the brochure that Gao has just submitted, they disaggregated the debt. And most of that debt, or a significant part of the debt, is pension liabilities. A lot of the debt is long-term debt. And about $17 billion in their document is short-term debt of which $7 billion is owed to the GRA. So it's really $10 billion if you exclude the GRA. And, and so, so that was the pressing problem, $10 billion of debt, not $82 billion. Now, on the other hand, we had received over $130 million US dollars from, from the European Union that went in, that did not go to Gaisuku, but was used, that came in for the sugar industry, but was used by the government. So, we, and this is important when we talk about Skeldon, the construction, which I'll come to in a moment. So the debt figure used by the government, when you disaggregate it, it's a totally different picture. The short-term debt is the big problem at this point in time. And that is about 10, maybe billion dollars or so. Now, is $10 billion a large figure? Yes, it is. But we lost in the Ghana Gold Board, under this government in the, past, in the first three years, $47 billion of losses. $47 billion of losses. We have made a decision that until now, in this new government, that until now we are not clear who made that crucial decision, whether it was the, the head of the GRA, the, chair, the board of the GRA, the Minister of Finance, or the Cabinet. A decision to give a write-off to a company that has exposed the Treasury to close to $80 billion of liabilities. And we're talking about seven, uh, $10 billion. So that is just to give you a perspective on affordability. We have raised taxes in this country in three years from $135 billion, that was the total tax take in 2014, it's $195 billion now. Just imagine, $60 billion more on a base of 135. In three years, the entire tax collections of this government has increased by over 40%, $60 billion more. Just last week, when the government said it could not find money to pay the teachers. I pointed out how seven items 
seven items, the growth in the expenditure under this government for seven items, local travel, celebration of national events, dietary, that's food, vehicle spares and maintenance, rental of buildings, other transport and, and travel, has grown by $5.1 billion in the last three years. That's more money that can pay all the teachers what they are determined for, and could have, been, could have carried the entire Gaisuko if that contribution was made to Gaisuko without sending home a single worker. But we increase expenditure on seven items that have no impact absolutely on welfare or economic growth in the country. I'm saying this because, could I, could I get some water, please? One time, morning, I, I need water to drink. I drank a lot of coffee, so I'm getting, and I'm just warming up, Joe. So, so, so the concept of affordability is, the government can't speak much about that. So let us go through the, so we spoke about the debt that the minister said they found. They didn't discover this when they got into office. Prior to the elections in 2015, we have an economic services committee. At that time, it was chaired by Carl Greenwich, who is now the vice president and, and um, minister of foreign affairs. And Gaisuko was required on several occasions to appear before the Economic Services Committee and to speak about their plans. And in, in the plan for Gaisuko, the expansion plan, the five years plan, they got all the numbers on the debt. So they did not discover this in 2015. They had that information pre-2015. Secondly, let's talk a bit about the COI. So Minister Harmon correctly pointed out that the president appointed the COI, named 10 persons. These are leading luminaries we heard in the sector. And they came up with some recommendations. And it is the right of every government to look, assess the situation when they get into office and decide on a course of action. But that commission of inquiry, what Minister Harman did say, recommended no closure of any estates. The COI the, 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 that the president appointed and spent close to $70 million on the COI, it recommended no closure of any estates. Um, a week after, the report came out, they decided to close Wales. And the president said, the COI that he put in place when you were, it was pointed out to him that your own COI said no closure, he said that's not gospel. Now, the timelines are a bit different too, because in November of that year, the government had already decided to privatize Gaisuko in whole or part. They issued a letter, the government of Ghana issued a letter to Mr. Curtin in November of 26, 2015 or 2016, I think it was, to, to say that you should look for investors to privatize Gaisuko in whole or part. In December, <coughs> Wales was closed. Wales was closed, the Gau did not know about it. They were not invited. That is the reality. That's fact. That's because the impression was created that somehow Gau was part of these decisions or we had an opportunity to consult on the decision, the decision to close the industry or close Wales. They were not invited. The closure was done. When we asked publicly, both Gao, the opposition, many, many other commentators, how did this happen? Was the decision made at the board? The board said no. 
Their ministers, minister said, no, he didn't make the decision. We, until today, we're not clear where the decision to close Wales was taken. Until today. But it is a fallacy, Minister Harmon, to say that anyone was consulted on this. Neither Gao nor the opposition. And it was done contrary to the recommendation of the CR. It is true that on the 30th of December, I received a letter, we received a letter, at that time I was now General Secretary of the PUP, invited us to consult with the government on the 31st of December. On the 30th, we received the letter, and we were supposed to go to the consultation on the 31st. And then we had two similar meetings in February, and that was the end of it. The perfunctory nature of the consultations at which Gao presented the, their document, but we insisted, we said, you cannot make a decision this crucial without going through studies. Your own COI recommended diversification studies. Let us pursue that so at least we will know where the displaced workers would go. Secondly, we should do a social impact study. And thirdly, an economic feasibility study. Those were the three studies we wanted because we wanted a theoretical basis, not a political basis, to guide the decision making regarding closure or not, or sending home workers or not. The government refused that. They said, we're there. So they proceeded then to place a green paper in parliament, the Minister of Agriculture, and that, not just that the COI has not been debated in parliament, and that tells you something, because the government steadfastly refused to debate the COI, uh, the report of the COI, but the green paper too, that the minister table, which was replete with, with inaccuracies, they refused to debate the green paper. And although the speaker, when, when, when Wales came up, we thought, sought to get a motion in parliament to discuss Wales, claiming that it was urgent, that there are nearly 2,000 people were gonna lose their jobs. The speaker disallowed it, couldn't dis debate it. The Economic Services Committee of the parliament decided to to hold consultations, which is normal, go out and meet people, and to have the Green Paper debated. Until now, that has not happened. In fact, the Speaker disallowed it too. So that is how the consultations have been going. Totally, no, it, it, nothing, it's just perfunctory. These decisions are made in a black hole, and I'll come to that, and. They used to accuse us of creating the black hole. Well, there's this hole now, and we, we never know about it. So let me, let me go, I'll come back to some other issues, but let me, let me just give you a few things. So last week, I, I had to meet the president, um, consulting on the, this is a constitutionally mandated consultation now, so the president had to pursue that that is regarding the appointment of the commissioner of police and the four deputy commissioners. And so I used the opportunity to raise the issue of sugar. And he said to me that, so I was trying to clarify the role of the SPU, NISIL, and the Ministry of Agriculture. And he said to me, it is the Ministry of Agriculture so I pointed out to him that the assets of Gaisuko or the closed estates have been transferred to Nissil and 100% of the shares of the Gaisuko have been transferred to Nissil. I was concerned about who will take over the pension liabilities of, of the sugar industry. So he said to me now in the future, it's all about that the lead ministry is the Ministry of Agriculture. They're not here today. We're pleased that the SPU is here. And so maybe we'll get some clarity on the way forward with the SPU, because as, unlike what Minister Harmon said, 
We are in the dark about many things, and I'll raise the issues that we are in the dark about. So, and I hope that when he clarifies it here from the SPU, someone else doesn't say the Ministry of Agriculture. That's not our plan, because that is what we've been having in this government. Until, so we know, but the president said it is the Ministry of Agriculture that will lead the changes. So let me point out to you some of the things that we're not clear about. So SPU, NISL has gone out to raise over $30 billion on the assets based on the assets of Gaisuko. They have, from what we gathered, that $17 billion have been raised so far, sitting in a bank account. The CEO of Gaisuko, recently the acting CEO, said we didn't receive any money. Nissil then had to say, no, you received $2 billion. So imagine the CEO doesn't know that they received $2 billion from Nissil. Nissil had to point that out to the CEO. So we asked, all right, where the remaining set of money? Uh, and what are you going to use it for? So we had a meeting. Our party wanted to find out from Gao whether they knew where Nissil or Gaisuko would be spending the money. They said they had a briefing, but until then, there is no document which says about what are the plans for the future of the industry. Absolutely none, and I hope we'll receive those today here, and whether they have this approval of the Ministry of Agriculture. So we have borrowed $15 billion or $17 billion. We're going to borrow another $13 billion shortly. We're sitting on this. We'll be sitting on this money. And we're no clearer on what the money will be spent for. Not the opposition, not the public, not Gao. Only somewhere else. So if I'm wrong, we are looking forward to hear what it will be spent on today. Because I've heard things from the grapevine that it's a refinery it is cogen facilities. That's what I've heard. But then why borrow the money now? If you're going to do a refinery and cogen facilities and you have to do the feasibility study, design them, go to tender, that's a year and a half from now. Why borrow the money and sit on it now and then pay 4.75% interest on $30 billion when you, you could have staged the borrowing? So the, the, the interest starts accruing. I've pointed out that if you keep the money at just two, a year and a half, you don't spend it. You're paying over two billion in interest costs alone. Interest costs, that, could have, that can fund the remaining severance for the workers. Just one year of interest costs. And they've borrowed the money and they're, and they're setting on it. So we're hoping to get answers. Answers today for all of, these, all of these issues. Now, there's been a huge fallacy, another fallacy about, when I say theoretical basis, about Skeldon itself. That somehow the politicians made a decision to go with Skeldon. We decided long, a long time ago that we want to make sugar viable after we were faced with the changes in the international environment, even before that. We knew the cuts were coming in the European Union market. So if you go to Booker Tate website, you will see that they said, Booker Tate itself said, um, or has written there, that in the year 2000, they were invited by Gaisuko to carry out a viability and expansion study. So we did not, the politicians, not even the members of the board, and many of them were qualified, they did not do this on their own. We had a theoretical basis. We invited a preeminent global company from Sugar to carry out the feasibility study and the expansion study, which they did. And they said, yes, it's feasible. We then went out through a public tender to secure the, the contractors. The CEO on, on the board at that time had Errol Hanuman, who was a member of the Bukate team. They made a decision that a Chinese contractor will do the Skeleton factory. But we were not satisfied that 
that that would probably yield results. So we then turn around, although Boca Tate had this management type of contract there, we turn around and gave them a, con a project management contract to manage, oversee the entire project. And, and guess what their terms of reference were? Manage the entire sugar modernization project, design, construction, and quality control for the factory. So we hired an international company to oversee the project. When the project failed to deliver on output because of bad decisions on the design, we sued them. That is what Nanda Gopal was speaking about, because they were supposed to look out for our interests. Not Nanda Gopal or any of the other board members, but a, the best company in the world in sugar at that time. But the decision was now made at a political level, and they failed to do it. We sued them, they won the case, and this government failed to settle with them rather than appeal the case. Rather than appeal the case. And so that decision was all technically determined, not politically determined. My contention is that this decision to close the industry has no technical basis, theoretical basis. It's a political decision. It's a political decision um, purely because I can't find any other way of, of describing it. I can't find any technical study to substantiate it. And so I, I don't want to go on too much. Um, because there are so many things here I want to, to go on, to talk about. We, we believe that sugar, because of its multifunctional nature in the economy, had they done that study, you would see that the transitional subsidy that we needed would be less than sugar's contribution to the economy. When you look at foreign currency and the the jobs and the linkages and the payment to NIS and the tax payments and the drainage and irrigation and all of that. And the same sports and other social things that Minister Harmon benefited from. And my mom worked in sugar too, so we all come from sugar too. So, so <laughs> but, but that's why we have all of us, Guyanese are tied up in, in this, in this. And, and so, um, I can, I can talk a bit more about the consultation process, but I don't want to, I don't want to go on to that. Um, I think in today's conference, let me just make it clear. This decision, let me repeat. The decision had no theoretical economic basis. Not the COI, not the, because they disregarded their, their own, the recommendations of their own COI. Two, there was no other study done. Three, the white papers, except the green papers that came to parliament have not been debated. So that's the first point. Secondly, there will be absolutely no consultation or consultative approach to the, to the decisions taken in the sugar industry. Absolutely nothing, no consultation. And, 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 and then this decision, has created serious, serious problems about the, in, in many of the areas. So we don't, we don't have a problem with change in the PBP, but we believe that change must come out of a, a, an orderly process. And that those workers who are now suffering, they must be, afforded help by this government. I want to contrast just, uh, maybe the last point. Contrast our approach to, to sugar and the, and the bauxite industry. We did have challenges in bauxite industry. As of today, we are carrying three, nearly three billion dollars of subsidy to the community community alone in the bauxite industry, in Linden and Kwakwani. We're subsidizing electricity, etc. And throughout the PPP era, we did it because we recognize 
that those communities had issues. When we knew that there was going to be a loss of jobs in the bauxite industry, we did an area study. We got a European Union grant of 12 million euros. We built roads into West Watuka and other areas to open up agricultural lands so people would have alternative. We created as a center for the incubation of small business. We created a small soft loan facility that our minister of this government now used to head. We built a call center up in, in Linden to, to get some of the displaced workers to go there. We trained some of the workers. Um, so we worked with the area because we knew we could not accommodate all of the jobs. There were gonna be need for changes. This government has just fired the workers, abandoned them, no help whatsoever, and in fact, the money that they earn, their severance, they have to keep begging for it, go to the court for it. They have to go to the court. And so, that is the, the callous nature of the government. I asked the president again, because I heard Minister Harmon say they're prepared to pay the severance, and I asked the president, he said a cabinet decision has been made to that effect, but when, again? When are we going to meet? And that meeting with Gao and Nasi, Gao and Nasi made it clear when we talk about the severance. They were not there to negotiate severance. They, they, they voiced their disagreement. Disagreement, they went to a meeting, they were called to the meeting. So, Minister saying that they were there creates the impression that they accepted that the severance could be staggered this way. We can find all the money now to help the industry in the current budget. There's no problem with not having, affording it. There's an issue of political will. And I don't know if the fact that most of the sugar workers or our support, political support, um, is strong in the sugar belt had anything to do with this decision. And, to, and I'm being right up front about this because I can't see an economic underpinning for it. Thank you very much.